when Marsha and I first met to begin planning programs for our guild, that lo we looked at the ideas of what art is. We considered the many people we know who practice, demonstrate, and demonstrate art through various ways. We thought of people who worked with forms and legends that lead to their expression. We considered more new groups coming to the state that are developing ways to bring different art forms to South Dakota. But just as we got excited about bringing in new and different artists, we realized that there were many people among us who have long careers immersed in art that um, we can make use of what they're doing. So the person that we have today both taught and, and continually discovers new ways to make traditional art seem exciting and new and always engaging with ways that interpret what art is. One of those masters of expression throughout her career is Professor Emerita Nancy Lyons. Nancy continually teaches me new ways to accept expression through art, more specifically wearable art. Nancy began drawing fashion design as a young girl growing up in North Dakota. She ma majored in fashion design to earn her bachelor's degree. Before she went on to get her master's in textiles and clothing, she worked as a designer for Jones of Dallas. These past many years, she has taught at SDSU. Everything from dress in world cultures, to fashion economics, to socio-psychological aspects of dress. But, and as a member of Art Guild, Nancy is continually fed by and the exhibitions that, like the current Sydney Stewart exploration of events in time and space. If you haven't seen Sydney, Sydney's retrospective exhibition yet, consider pieces in it that make use of, of intricate design with vast material sewing to create her art. So now won't you join me in welcoming my friend, Nancy Lyons, who's going to talk to us about wearable art. All right. The history of clothing and fashion stretches back to antiquity. Therefore, initially, when Jeannie asked me to give this talk, I had a really difficult time knowing where to start. Nancy, I'm sorry, you're going to need to stand back here. So you're in the camera. Oh, sorry. Okay. There you go. I'm used to walking amongst my students, so this will be difficult to be separating myself from my students, Carolyn. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, clothing is fundamentally an ornamental mask for the human form, but it certainly can do more than keep us warm and more than just sort of adorn us. I've got some examples here of wearable art, and I'm hoping that you can see imagination and expression in these pieces. They are surely intense visual documents, aren't they? Yes. Absolutely intense visual documents. These were made of a slower design process than mass produced clothing and of a small, slower construction process also than mass produced clothing. Those who engage in wearable art design need to plan for putting months into a single garment. I've read of more than a year being put into constructing a single garment. But they're absolutely incredible, aren't they? The materials that are used and the contortions that they take, in teaching fashion, I often talk about balance, proportion, rhythm, emphasis, unity. And for any of these examples, I could go on and on and on about that use of design principles, but also the elements. Look at the texture. Look at the colors. How uh, very interestingly nuanced they are here, almost as an ombre effect, which we know has been recycling back into a trendy way fairly recently. 
this piece, I know that you cannot read the label there, but it says Alexander McQueen, very well known British fashion designer who died by suicide in 2010. What Alexander McQueen said is, what I do is artistic expression, which is channeled through me. Fashion is just the medium. For him and others, it became a way to express a personal vision. The pieces cost several thousand dollars. His firm, some of you may know, created the wedding dress worn by the Princess of Wales. Others, maybe students in my classes, would realize that this happens to be a current Alexander McQueen piece. And though the firm stays with his name, Sarah Burton has been the designer since his death in 2010. And this was Sarah Burton's very last collection. She did just a fabulous job of maintaining the target market that McQueen was going for. So I'm gonna be really eager to see what will happen to the McQueen line now. Do you feel that this is unique? <laughs> Do you feel that it could have emotional connections for some. You see, these sorts of items don't intend to impact or influence universal fashion trends. That's what fashion aims for. But the pieces I am focusing on here have more preciousness and self-awareness. I graduated from high school in 1970 and wearable art then was a fascinating phenomenon. It had begun in the 1960s. And yes, I did jeans like this. I'm sick that I did not keep them. I no longer have them. I made them in college. So in you know, 70, I graduated, went on to NDSU and embroidered my jeans just like this. And I wasn't a hippie. But this was very much a hippie style that grew from the anti-establishment West Coast in the 1960s, when people lovingly embroidered, dyed, painted, and patched their jeans. This was folk art. Clothing embellishment blossomed. Young people utilized traditional techniques in unconventional ways. These ancient techniques were enriched by storytelling. And again, how I wish I still had mine. I don't own this book, but it must be a wonderful book. And on YouTube, there are many, many uh, videos that we can look at to learn more about the book. It was published in 1986, and it tells about Julie Schaffler Dale's Artisans Gallery. That gallery existed from 1973 till 2013. I went to the gallery in 1978 after completing my first year of teaching here when I took a summer session at FIT in New York City. Now, since then, I've been to New York City probably every third or fourth year with students. We never went to the gallery, but probably that is because we tended to rely on others who would create the uh, travel studies agenda for us. But I'm glad to say that I have been there and it was just a really wonderful experience where we are going to um, hear from Julie Schaffler Dale herself about her gallery. This is a four minute video. We're in Manhattan, in Midtown. We're in my home up on the 18th floor. This is where I moved with my new husband in 1981. And the apartment has gotten denser and denser and denser with time. Um, and I think the word eclectic 
would probably characterize it. I'm a born and bred New Yorker. I come out of an art history background. And in my apartment, which was on West 58th Street at that time, I started to accumulate things and people. <laughs> the work was so exciting that I realized it was time to go public with it. And that's when I found a space and opened in September of 1973. We opened at 687 Madison Avenue. I was probably too innocent to know to be frightened. I just knew the work was extraordinary and unlike anything I had seen before. As I sold work to clients, I instinctively knew which pieces were important that were definitive. When there is an amalgam, when there's a coming together, a harmony, a certain alchemy of form and content and process, you watch someone's work and it builds to a crescendo and you just know when it's hit that note. And that's the definitive piece. There were enough of those that I realized it was time to document. I started reconnecting with people who had bought pieces because I knew I was going to want to borrow back. I also started realizing that what I was doing was not just buying pieces I like, but that I was building the foundations of a collection. Why? Because I wanted there to be a legacy for these pieces. And I knew coming from an art history background, that's what you do. You collect, you hope to exhibit, and you hope to find ongoing conservation. For the book, we chose to re-photograph everything so there would be a commonality <laughs> of background and presentation. So everything was borrowed back and Otto Stupakov was engaged to be the photographer. We would bring groups of pieces down to Otto's studio and they would be mounted on dowels and then suspended in space so that they could breathe and have air around them. And then there were the model sessions. So three-dimensional or two-dimensional. Even the Met loaned us some pieces at that time, which we had to handle with white gloves. It was a shock that pieces that I knew so intimately, I could no longer touch other than wearing white Muslim gloves. And now I can't even get that close to them. The book was published in 86, and it is a sumptuous presentation worthy of the pieces which were presented as artworks, not as fashion. I wanted people to see the pieces individually, which I hoped was a reflection of what the artists intended. I looked and looked for Elton John pictures last night and hoped that one of them would say something about Julie Artisan's gallery. It did not. However, in one of the many articles I read about Julie, she was quoted as saying that she is so proud that she drew so many celebrity customers to her gallery, especially for major pieces. And she said that Elton John collects the work as does Quincy Jones. Now, these aren't necessarily from the gallery, but at least to Nels and John, I knew, and I don't know if we still, yeah, we've got a couple of guys here. I feel bad. These are the only, this is the only slide I have with men's apparel, all right? <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't bring my costume. <laughs> I'm sorry you didn't bring your costume too. Oh, these are examples 
wonderful examples. In this case, two layers, felt and a little bit of leather underneath acting as an underlining, lots of crochet work. This one we did see in her gallery as well. Can you remember that? The fest. It kind of makes me think about sustainability too in this case, doesn't it? I mean, think of all the things that we are, you know, getting rid of and maybe instead we should think about, oh, I could make that into a several months long process <laughs> and come up with some wearable art. So much of wearable art is not fitted these obviously are, and they're very closely fitted to the legs, kind of a leggings variation. They've been knitted, but please don't miss the shoes. You know, the socks we might expect to be knitted, but we may not expect to find knitted shoes. I brought this with me, and this was mine. I want to emphasize that fashion is a sociocultural and aesthetic phenomenon. Now here I was a decade after dressing for success was emphasized in business. That was 1978 and prior to that in 1977 when I applied for my job, I very carefully tailored a beautiful two-piece matching suit, skirted suit, said John T. Malloy, you didn't want pants on women back then. So I think that in a way when I made this creation and I submitted it to Threads Magazine where it was pictured, I think in a way that it just was right for me for the time because I had been very conscious of dressing for success, maybe partly because of my younger age as being a college teacher. And I felt that I had to represent uh, represent some state, some semblance of power, for example. And so then to move on to something that instead is a, a skirt and a top, a two-piece outfit, I feel like maybe that's why, I, maybe it was a matter of not enough time too, I don't know. But that's why I just did what would be the yoke area of the dress in a patchwork pattern. Still, it was labor intensive. It was important to get just the right fit. And so often, with wearable art, it is looser in fit. Here's an example. Jean is the name of a woman who graduated from Pratt in 1970, the same year that I graduated from high school. She's best known for her multimedia coats that are often made of wool. And her designs are inspired by myths, symbolic imagery, and spiritual journeys. These are somewhat kimono-like, and that does tend to be the favored form in what we call wearable art. What she says on this slide is, I see the world as one of color, pattern, texture, and form. And while they all matter so much, it's form that I'm zeroing in on right now, and on the next several slides I chose likewise, I want you to see how the looseness, so that the fit mechanism isn't an additional property that the designers need to work with, because fitting takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, and instead they were primarily making these pieces to be worn by whomever might come into the shop to buy them. So several pieces that are loose-like, um, not necessarily kimono shape, but so many sources would say that the kimono shape is the favored shape used by those involved in wearable art making. Wool is often a wonderful fabric fiber to use. And these are current examples that I found online. 
because sometimes you might think, well, I, I love my art guild association. I want people to notice my dress a little bit more. And I want to be thought of as someone who is kind of an arts and crafts person. And if that is the case, I did find slides from current examples to share with you. In some cases, it's more the printing on the fabric maybe spattering with uh, lots of paint, for example, rather than what I would think to be the more time-consuming process of working with embroidery or beading or patchwork or cross-stitch and so on. But I think though her arms aren't spread out like I just did mine, we still get the feeling that the shape is rather tunic-like. This is an example of a Chinese brand. And my emphasis here is not to get you to know names of artists or names of brands. I just want you to get an overall appreciation of what wearable art is. But it does tell us that we use Ursima as the name of our brand to, brand to reflect the awakening of female consciousness represented by Ursima, to affirm females' right to pursue not only truth, goodness, and beauty, but also liberty and happiness. And on their site, I found many, many beautiful examples. These are not from the Ursima site, but again, a chance for you to see color, texture, line, all of it placed on a very simple, loosely fitted silhouette so quite a variety of potential try-on customers might be able to fit into these wearable art pieces, buy them and wear them. The difference, of course, for the one on the left is the sleeves have been omitted, but it still has a loose form, almost an exaggerated shawl collar, and for both of them, we can see wonderful quilting, stitching, mix of fabrics. We're back to wool again with the example on the left. And we can see how some uh, shredding and some dismembering sometimes is involved in wearable art production. There is to the jacket on the left a button, you know, a regular old button as a fastener, but lots of what we're seeing are devoid of buttons or zippers, things that we typically associate as necessary for closed closure of pieces that we wear. Likewise, sleeves have been omitted on these, so we have vest variations where the one on the left is just a wonderful example of using a circular ruffle rather than a ruffle that's cut from a straight piece of fabric that needs to be uh, gathered with a couple rows of stitching and then pulled together. This one is what we call a circular ruffle and I think it's been just beautifully used in this piece. And then notice the distressing as we look at the slide on the left side of her hip as well. I almost get the feeling too of distressing in the vest on the right. Yes, there's quilting, there is stitching, but I feel like there's been a conscious attempt to fray some of the raw edges. Now I put in several pieces that are crochet-like and I want to introduce the term avant-garde because maybe in a way, since now I'm moving into pieces that you could buy today and wear today, maybe we're past wearable art movement and maybe instead we should consider using a word such as avant-garde. That refers to a fashion that is very experimental. And the fashion designer who we could label as being an avant-garde designer 
probably experiments with design and tries to wear something that's never been designed, never been worn before. Its look is entirely unconventional. Don't you feel that when you look at her? Even beyond the imagination, my goodness, who would have thought of that? <laughs> and more crocheted pieces. These two are available today online. I did not record the names of all the websites, but it does show you that there are possibilities out there that remind us of that 70s artwear phenomenon and that if the expression of them is right for you, you might be able to buy it at less than it would cost you at Julie Artisan's gallery. <laughs> Again, I was on a crochet kick, I guess, but aren't they quite beautiful? And I have to say that I'm really subjective when I choose pictures. I'm very guilty of this for uh, teaching and teaching classes too. I'm not going with things where, you know, you're, you've, you've got lots of looseness and, and too much is showing, am I? No, I'm, I'm very, very careful about that. <laughs> Now here, maybe you would want to wear a slip underneath the skirt on the left, but I think it's absolutely gorgeous and something that we could buy today that really resembles wearable art. Yeah, aren't they interesting? Found them in totally different places, but just wonderful use, I'm sure, of wool fiber and kind of an interesting variation of weaving almost for the vest that we can only see, that we can see on the left. I would love to see what they looked like on the right, and that was not available to me online. This firm Likewise, I'm telling you it's this is available right now, and I'm giving you the exact price for the skirt. Oh my, this was it's an Italian firm. It was founded in 1966, way, way back. And they developed a really distinctive leather weaving design. So really started out more with handbags. But when I saw this for this year, I thought I have to show you this. Isn't that quite amazing use of weaving? They didn't launch their ready to wear till the 1990s. And I have been in their store in Paris. So Bottega Venata has a store in Paris. They tend to do a lot with clutch bags and I didn't put any of those photos in here. But these still are Bottega Venata. Again, not wishing to emphasize them, but there were so many things from this fall that I felt resembled wearable art. So I decided that I would share them with you almost have the feel of pom-poms and lots of fringe, don't we? Wonderful use of curved lines. Oh, in the red and white on the left, just meandering lines, just beautiful. And interesting use of proportion and emphasis for both of them as well. Could you feel comfortable wearing this? <laughs> feel like, you know, petting my dog or petting my cat up there. It does maybe have some awkward spots because I feel like there is one of these kind of pom-pom things <laughs> in her back buttocks. But, but I just love, I love, love, love the feeling of the weaving that creates the actual bodice and the skirt. That's 2024. These two are Venata, uh, Venata, but I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't write down. They're fairly recent. I don't know if they're 2023 20, or 2024, but look what happens. I almost get the feeling for the one on the left, there's been some paint 
that's been splattered. Don't you get that feeling? And you know, the, the textile too, the printing and the patterning on the textile is something that matters. I've got various things with me here too that show, now here's an example of what they call some art prints. And then I have another picture with me that shows spattering, splattering. You know, how fun can that be? Seeing these pieces that have been carefully designed for wearing, but they were also, many of them, intended to be seen as conceptual or fine art. Each one evokes the maker's artistic expression. Each one evokes the maker's aesthetic taste. Art is wearable. Don't you think? Yes. <laughs> for museum folks in preparing your catalogs for exhibits, see how, see he slashed his apparel, and maybe I'm not close enough to you, Carolyn now can see it, to see that the cover, back and front cover, of this exhibition catalog was also slashed. I'll just, you know, think of the time it takes. I've seen some of these, too, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It is a good idea to go to museums when they have fashion items for exhibit. We didn't show fashion items for years and years and years other than armor. And I loved going to the armor gallery at the Metropolitan Museum. I don't know what it was about that. But in fact, when you asked me to do this talk, at first I thought, I started thinking about, you know, there's so many ways, so many things that we can call wearable art. And that armor, of course, needs to be functional, but it was just amazingly aesthetically thought through as well. And so, in terms of this book, uh, do make sure that if you're traveling and you see that a museum has an exhibit devoted to fashion and wearable art, please make a point to take a look at it. I don't see any librarians in here, but I love this one because these are old-fashioned library cards. Library oh. do date. <laughs> <laughs> How fun, you know, would many of us think of that? Oh, and I also probably erred in emphasizing fashion and dress items because we should also say that some jewelry can be considered wearable art and accessories can be considered wearable art. And look at this very, very unique handbag. Usually when we think of an expensive and unique handbag, we think of leather, but leather was not the material used there. Please interrupt me. Think of questions. Oh, I just wondered, do you watch my favorite show, Project One Runway? <laughs> I do like your favorite show, Linda. And as long as you reached out to me, will you stand up? Because Linda is someone who, whenever we have these meetings, she's really found wearable art. <laughs> she wears it quite frequently. Turn and trust yes, me. Maybe that comes too from watching a little bit of Project Turn Runway. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn, too, wore wearable art today. Thank you, both of you. Yes, and that is another way that I could have gone, Joan. Right. With Native but American. That, again, when you said wearable art, it's never ending what you can find in visuals 
and now on YouTube as well. Yes, forgive me, I did not include any of that, but I would certainly consider that to be wearable art. Yes. I'm wondering if I, if I heard you correctly, did you say that wearable art can go out of style? Or does, or does wearable art go out of style? It seems to me like it might not. I, if if I said it, I misspoke. I'm with you. I don't really think it will does go out of style. I I think that a lot of it you you can hang on to for decades. But I know we all know that fashion comes and goes all the time, like like the jeans that we wish we had kept. But. Yeah, it's because it's so unique that there is, you can't label it as a particular style necessarily. Right. Is that, is that why it might not be? Right, yes. Yeah, they're not trying to follow trends. Trends are something that those who are in the fashion industry need to be up on, and those who might design clothing need to be very much into but no, in fact, that's why when I said that looks like ombre for one of the pieces yeah. I found, I thought, oh yeah, it really does. But uh, that really isn't their uh, effort. They, 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 they do not make an effort to they're follow not trends. To be no, inspired. they're not. They're not. I, when I saw the jeans, and when you mentioned the jeans again, I, I, my first thought was uh, that's a history lesson <sighs> on, a, on fabric. There were, you know, if you if you were up close enough, you could see the the individual patches and that sort of thing. Um, I'm a I graduated from high school in '66, and you know, those are all to me those evoke uh, memories. Could you hear, Marcia? She well, said that the jeans voice? kind of reminded her of a history lesson of fabric. Yes, and in fact, for those jeans, that is more. Um, trend-like, isn't it? That is more ordinary fashion than wearable art. But um, I have good memories of, memories of that, those college years and working on mine, and that really preceded wearable art. Like, it was the 60s decade that there was a lot of that going on with jeans, and of course I was behind times, so I wasn't doing it till the <laughs> 70s. And then that's when no, you know, wearable art. <laughs> came into being. Can you repeat that question? Oh, good question. Can you repeat it? Pearl wonder. Nancy? Yeah. Is there generally a fabric that they use as a background? Oh, Pearl, I think it's just all over the place. I found myself mentioning wool frequently in sharing these slides, but I don't think it needs to be limited to that. In fact, last night then, when I was editing them down, I found current pieces that were metal. It kind of reminded me of Nail the Runway that's done here in Brooklyn. <laughs> and, and then in time, I, I took them out. So no, I don't think it would be accurate to say there's a typical <laughs> material or fabric. Yes. Is there a museum anywhere that just is devoted to fashion and changes over the years or different kinds? Or? Well, the, the one in New York City does have a, uh, a, a, a wonderful fashion storage collection space. And since I'm an instructor, they did let me, and Karen, weren't you and Loni with me when we did that? We went to you know, New York City and didn't we go behind the scenes in the, yeah. So, so there are collections uh, that emphasize fashion and that, so then occasionally they'll put fashion pieces on display for their exhibits, but it's really wonderful to have a chance to go behind the scenes and see what all is there. It probably does. Probably does. Have to Google and see. No. Yes. I 
I wonder. She wonders if when Julie Schaffler Dale's <coughs> store, really, exhibit space closed, did anyone collect that? But you know, her video, she said it was she in mentioned her house. I wonder if she has a lot of room. I would love to visit her home <laughs> in Manhattan. I wonder if she's managed to keep a lot of pieces and then maybe donated some to the Metropolitan yes, Museum. Yes, the Met has some. 